Um, it's my honor to be your room host today and to introduce our speakers this morning. We have C.J. Buck, the CEO of Buck Knives, and Phyllis Best, the CFO. I'm going to do a little more of a history approach. I'm going to share four generations of Buck history. It is a family business. I'm going to tell you how we had a near-death experience back in the late 90s really prompted a, a, an openness for change. So I'm going to kind of tell you how we got there, uh, uh, some of the things that we've done, and how we had been kind of battling our financial reporting, intuitively knowing we were doing the right things, but really difficult to prove it on paper. This is my great-grandfather, Hoyt Heath Buck. He was born in Leavenworth, Kansas. In 1945, he and my great-grandmother lived in Mountain Home, Idaho, and my great-grandmother's health was failing. And so they were getting out of North Idaho, getting down to San Diego to move in with their oldest son, who was my grandfather. My father, my grandfather, my father, my uncle, and my grandmother's little brother, the, the four of them, were all through the... 50s, they would, uh, they would sharpen saws and tune lawnmowers in the spring, and they would make knives in the fall in preparation for, for hunting and, and, and Christmas. And that kind of kept this little fledgling business going. We incorporated in 1961, and the business really took off, so we had meteoric growth. And, and that, was the, that was the environment that my father grew up managing. Uh, you know, kind of a, a situation where you, you can't really do anything wrong. You know, there's just there's so much success, it could hide a lot of mistakes. I became VP of admin in 94, and when we introduced ourselves to Mass Merchant, and it started with Kmart and was quickly surpassed by, uh, by Walmart, we, we saw dramatic increases in business, but dramatic decreases in, in margin percentages. A lot of complexities, a lot more inventory required because the fluctuations were just huge. Um, <clears throat> I, became, see, I became president in 1999. And 1999 was the first year we lost money. <laughs> so now I look back and I think, I feel like we dodged a bullet because I don't know how close we were to actually going bankrupt or not. And, and I think Luckily, at the time, I don't think I realized how dangerous the situation was. So as we started putting the wheels back on in 2001, 2001 looked like it was going to be a decent year until 9-11. Now, 9-11 had a very specific impact on um, the knife market. Um, <clears throat> so we put together a, a, a mentor board where instead of meeting monthly and kind of having a CYA session every month, we went to meeting quarterly and looking forward to those meetings. And, and that was really where the, 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 the new lean business model came. And the two real key things that lean meant to us as a business was that we were going to focus on eliminating waste and we were going to focus on our customers, on, on delivering uh, value to customers. So how did that impact us. It really impacted us across every department. So, so the challenge to our manufacturing was reduce cost by 30 percent. What can you do? And these were the two, these were the two ways that we reduced cost by 30 percent. We, we implemented lean manufacturing on the floor and we relocated from Southern California, a very expensive place to do business, to uh, Post Falls, Idaho. From a finance standpoint, we got into this using standard costing. We kept moving forward even though our books were telling us we weren't making the right decisions. Intuitively, you knew you were making the right calls. Near-death experiences, it's a great change motivator. And that's, that's the way it was for us. So how do you make sure that uh, your books reflect properly? I'll turn it over to Phyllis. All right, thank you. 
Well, first thing I want to get out of the way is that that six weeks to close was not on my watch. <laughs> <laughs> True. <laughs> I've been with the company since 2005 when they moved up from Idaho. And uh, we were closing in five days then. And maybe some analysis goes over into the second week. But uh, six weeks, I don't think I could live with. A little bit of history. Um, the, the, the roots for lean accounting for Buck Knives actually started back in about 2000. And uh, uh, we had Ori Fumé come in, and he brought his real numbers book with him. And uh, that was a reading assignment for everyone for a while. So that, that indoctrinated us to what it means to account lean. And we weren't ready for that then. Uh, there, we were just starting to look at uh, work sales and flow and trying to figure out operationally what lean was all about. So lean accounting was somewhere out there in the future. We knew that it, we would eventually get there, but we weren't there in Cal in, back in those days. In the fall of 2005, uh, uh, Phil Duckett and I, he's the Executive Vice President of Operations, uh, went to Michigan and we went to this little meeting called Lean Accounting Summit. And there, we heard this really inspiring speaker called Brian Maskell. And the rest, as they say, is history. <laughs> so we brought Brian in. He's been to our place many times. And he introduced to us uh, the, the whole idea of value streams. What is a value stream? And, and we, we, we took about a week and dissected our company, and, but most importantly, helping us figure out the, the flow through our company, What's, how to get to those value streams that, that were important for us. And immediately after the value stream uh, identification, the next thing we had to do was, okay, get rid of standard cost. Well, like most accountants, I've lived my whole career with standard cost. And the first thing Brian had us do was stop tracking labor, stop uh, tracking work orders, don't do work orders. Uh, so we gulped real big and we did that. And, and, and it's, it's, it's working, it's living in a black hole for a while because our old system was still standard cost. We were still booking standard cost on the, uh, through the general ledger. Um, and, but we were constructing value stream P&Ls with Excel. Uh, Chris Potts, my cost accounting manager, is back here. And he is really good at Excel. So we booked, we, we produced weekly P&Ls through Excel. Um, and struggled with allocations because when you don't have the groundwork laid, to, to book costs through a value stream, you're going to have to do some allocations. Not a lot, not nearly as many as we s started out to have. Uh, but that first year, we, uh, we operated somewhat in a black hole. Uh, we produced the weekly P&Ls, and we struggled with the metrics, which we'll talk about a little bit later. We started booking a lot more period cost at, rather than defer cost into the balance sheet. Um, and we also had to start educating everyone, management on down, uh, what do these new financial statements mean. I have to say, in, in identifying the value streams, probably the hardest part was the people part. Um, we had, and we, we've asked a lot from our value stream leaders and the, and the managers of our company. The easy part was moving the machines around. A lot of the machines, we were able to move those into the value streams. So we got people, we got machines in the value streams. We've got, we have inventory, operating supplies that's going to value streams. So a lot of progress that we've made there in the last year. I call these the CFO's metrics. But for me as CFO, I have three metrics that really tell me whether or not we're on the right track. The P&L might look like hell. But, the, but if my inventory levels are going down, if the cash is flowing, I can pay people on time. And if my bank debt is dropping, my balance sheet's looking good, and I'm happy. And, and that's what I've been seeing this year. 
the P&L doesn't look good. We have flushed a lot of inventory through our P&L this year and we did it pretty much at cost and that just really tears your margins up. Other metrics, these are, these are some that report especially at the value stream as well as corporate level. Uh, units sold, built or purchased, um, revenue per unit, cost per unit, inventory turns, th those are pretty, pretty basic metrics. Some new metrics that we've picked up since we've implemented lean is the hurdle rate. And we did it by month because we're seasonal. These, the hurdle rate's going to get better as we go along, uh, as we get more information in running lean. Uh, conversion cost per unit is another important uh, metric for us right now, uh, especially looking at it from a trend basis. So how are we doing? Are we cutting out waste? Uh, how, what does the trend look like? The cell measurements. Uh, metrics are different depending on who's using the metrics, what, what the needs are. So the cell measurements day by hour boards, by the hour boards are used and this, and it is daily, it's hourly. And this is an important metric for all the cells uh, that, that they generate the information and just by a walk by they can, they can look to, at that board to see how they're doing. Um, measurements also include the, as, as it's listed there, uh, hourly units, first time through, that's important, how, and how's it trending. Um, QA, tack time, um, how are we doing on that? Is tack time coming down? Um, and then daily issues and corrections. And one thing that we've done recently, uh, and this, this is at the shop level, every day at 9 o'clock we have a stand-up meeting in front of a, an outage board that's in shipping. And that's a real failure if there's anything on that board. If we fail to ship to a customer, why? And every day we have that stand-up meeting out there in front of that board. Box score. This is a very comprehensive tool and Brian introduced that to us and we've started to use it and, uh, and we've color coded it so that we can see immediately uh, the areas that's controlled by the value stream and what's financial uh, measurements and, um, and then also value stream and support areas. And one of the things that I would note on here, we've got the future state over there on the end uh, and, and this, there's enough buckets on here and they're weekly buckets that allows us to, to uh, see some trending and we also don't lose sight of the, the, uh, where we're going. What's our future state? How well are we doing against that goal out there? And the hurdle rate at the bottom. So there's a lot of information on there for a value stream. Our lean accounting journey, inventory. And that second bullet says, if lean, why is valuation still a factor? Well, the real world is we're seasonal. Uh, we ship most of what we make in maybe the last of the year. And we have a customer that is very large and gives us thousands of uh, quantity orders at a time and you've got three days to ship. So there's no way that we can uh, operate with pure pull. So what do we do? How, how do we handle that? Fortunately, we get a forecast that allows us to level load the factory in the early months of the year. For everything else, we pull. So we built a forecast, unfortunately, to level load the factory, but we also built a pull uh, for the rest of our customers. And it works just, it works really well. But to do that then, we, because we have inventory, we also have to value that inventory and how do we do that? It's really easy. We take the, the cost that runs through the value stream divided by the units. That's the conversion cost. That's how we value inventory. Really simple. Decision making with lean. Um, it's, it's really made a difference in the way we look at, at, uh, at costing. Uh, I've got two examples up here. The holiday program. Uh, this is a huge program <coughs> with that, that one big customer uh, we struggled with that. They, of course, they're all, it's all about price with them. 
And uh, it running that program, running it through the standard cost model, would have said, we're not doing it, sorry. But running it through our lean model, we realized that we weren't going to add any more people, we weren't going to buy any more machines, we didn't need any more floor space, we had the capacity, we could take care of the other customers as well as this one, and all, all we were going to be buying was the material and some operating supplies. But I took money to the bank, so it was the right thing to do, and we wouldn't have done it if we hadn't been accounting with lean. Capital investment decisions ha have been impacted as well. We have, in, in our metal fabrication uh, department, we, we typically, we, we do fine blanking to stamp out knife blades out of steel, and we can also do laser cutting. And the way our standard cost system ha uh, costed this out, it's all about volume and, and fine blanking. And every time that we produce a new product, we would have to buy tooling, spend money on tooling, so that we get the volume, so that we get the cost down per unit. That turned out not to be a, a good, smart business decision. There's a lot of risk when you do that, because you don't know if that new product's going to take off in the marketplace. You're going to spend all this money on tooling before you even get the first run off. Why not use the laser, you know, cut some, a pilot program with it, even though it's slower, it, it, it standard cost that it was driving a decision toward fine blanking and spending that capital. So we're now using that laser machine. It allows us more flexibility to run, make smaller runs, uh, test that product in the marketplace. Different decisions we're making now than we were making on standard cost. It's already saved us thousands of dollars. Some results. This happened, the floor space reduction by 50,000 square feet happened while we were still in California. And we're continuing to free up capacity. And that is challenging our sales force. Uh, that's what lean is all about. Cut out waste, free up capacity, and then hammer on your sales force to go out and sell that capacity. And it's challenging our sales force. Actually, we have a meeting set up for next week off-site to strategically address growing we have the capacity to grow. It's a great problem to have. And we have better flexibility. As a result of that, we'll end this year at 10% more sales than we had last year. The other thing that we've done, we've brought suppliers into our value stream. And that's worked out really well. We have uh, vendor managed inventory now. And I'm happy on the cash flow side. Inventory reductions, 30% from last year. Flexible workforce. This has been, the workforce flexibility is a big thing. Lean has uh, fostered a philosophy that the more you learn, the more jobs you learn how to do out there on the shop floor, the more valuable employee you are to us as a company, the more money you're going to make, you're rewarded when you go through that process. And so the HR side of this whole thing is, is big. Um, <clears throat> and very important. Uh, reduced overtime hours 49% year to date. It's a huge improvement over last year and it's because we're able to schedule much better. We're using the FP process, sales, operations, planning, finance. finance. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, we're using that process to, uh, to plan and uh, this is, this is the, that's been a huge change for us as a company to have uh, the sales group and the planning group and operations group all in the same room talking together, uh, talking about customers, talking about capacity, and we're operating finally as one company. Uh, lean accounting and the auditors. Well, we have the first audit the end of this year with, uh, with lean accounting statements, but I think that we've uh, made a preemptive strike here uh, one of the workshops that Brian hosted for us um, back uh, on cost accounting, we brought the auditors in. We're fortunate in that our auditors are in Spokane, which is just really close to our plant. So we brought the managing partner in and, and the, the manager for, that's on our audit team. Let them spend a day with us and with Brian understanding what we were doing. 
And it, what it boiled down to, they're okay if we flush a lot of things through the P&L, they don't care. All they care about is making sure that the balance sheet is accurate. And once they felt comfortable with what we were doing for valuation for inventory, and they understood the theory of it and how we were getting there, they were fine. 